All right. Uh, clock is started. Uh, you're good to go. All right. Greetings and salutations, everyone. We have our second guest ever, Dr. Kirk Honda. Second. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, our first guest was Adam, who is a furry. And, and a movie reviewer. Yes. Mm. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should have said that in reverse order. He's a movie <laughs> reviewer who happens to be a furry. Um, I had stuffed animals as a kid. Does that count? I I mean, it's. do you like Disney movies? Yeah. Do you like the anthropomorphic animals? Yeah. Do you think some of their voices are kind of suave and cool? Uh, depends on which one. Like the fox from Robin Hood. Yeah. Okay, there you go. I mean, you're... You're halfway there. You're halfway there. <laughs> oh, I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so um, do you want to explain what you do on your channel? Sure. So I've been podcasting for over 15 years, and I try to provide psychological concepts to benefit people and to uh, fight misinformation, and I try to make it interesting and educational. I don't know if I succeed, but uh, I will do, I'll do deep dives on concepts that uh, might take me months to prepare for, like, mm. an, like an academic lecture. Um, as a professor, I'm oriented that way, but I will also do quite frivolous pop things like reacting to 90 Day Fiance or, My favorite. or Love is Blind. <laughs> My favorite was actually your uh, Elliot Rogers. Oh. Uh, deep dive. I really enjoyed listening to that. Oh, oh thanks. Um, but yeah, you do a lot. Uh, so the YouTube channel is Psychology in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found you, well, how many years was it? Four four yeah. years ago? Something like um, that. And you were watching 90 Day Fiance. And uh, it's, I hope you don't take this as weird, but uh, you remind me a lot of my dad. Hmm. Uh, my dad, super smart guy, uh, psychology minor, or sorry, bachelor's degree in psychology. And then, uh, he wanted to become a professor, but he, uh, you know, came from immigrant parents who wanted him to be a lawyer or a doctor. Mm. So he chose lawyer. Mm. Um, but just the, uh, very intelligent, thoughtful, caring, the way that you deliver things is very therapeutic to me. Mm. And uh, I started watching you when my dad started um, getting worse with his, he has early onset Alzheimer's. Mm. So there was something really comforting about it. And you were talking about 90 Day Fiance and uh, the way that you were breaking things down, it, it was very disarming and it was, it was nice to see somebody talk about relationships as if like them being toxic or like an issue isn't the end all be all and that you can like work through things like those conversations are super important to have. And I've, I've watched other psychology YouTubers kind of break things down and they're a little bit more cold, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. Um, well, and there's also this category as well, where there's a little bit mudding of the water. There's like, for a while, there's like a lot of body language experts, oh, which God. isn't the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the so language. it is very different. It's refreshing to come from that, like, you know, using this as a jumping off point to talk about something bigger, Mm -hmm. uh, very different from the community I come from, which is like a lot of opinion first. (laughs) Opinion first with not a lot of like reason other Mm -hmm. than like what is going to be in favor in the, on the internet, Mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. Well, high, high praise, high praise. I mean, uh, 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 can we just end the podcast (laughs) now? I I just walk away uh, because I I feel like it's only downhill from here. (laughs) As I make a fool out of myself somehow, but yeah, that, that, that's, yeah, that's, well, yeah, it just makes me feel good that you yeah. see it that way. Super impactful for me. So, and I, we always used to joke when we moved here, we're like, what if we see Kirk Honda in the wild? Like, wouldn't that be <laughs> And crazy? then you did. And then we did. Yeah. We, I, we were at a breakfast place. Yeah. I was eating my last meal before I had to starve myself for a colonoscopy. Ah. I, uh, was, I mean, this is TMI, probably not, <laughs> but I, uh, they give you a chance to eat until 9 a.m. Mm. And then you have to uh, starve yourself and take that laxative and vacate, you know, every possible thing in your body. And so I thought uh, I'd go to a breakfast place and I walked in and then sit down and I look up and <laughs> there, there the two of you are. I was like, it, for a half a second, I thought, 
oh, I'm watching YouTube right now. Yeah. It was weird. Yeah. I, I, I thought I, 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 this strange. isn't happening in real life. And then, is, oh, you're, you're actually physically here. <laughs> it's so crazy because we eat at that place a lot. And uh, it was actually the second day after our dog had passed and mm. we were trying to like get back into functioning mm. and we decided like, let's just go eat. And you showing up, it just felt crazy. We had just signed up for therapy again, both of us. We have our own therapist. Mm. Um, and it was just like the wildest. It was a nice little boost. It felt it like, like, that was cool. Yeah, it just felt like Blitz, our dog had sent, you know, made this happen. Like mm. he's up there kind of like, you know, it was very cool. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. Also, uh, Ian for my birthday got uh, uh, you playing the guitar for me on um, cameo. Fiber? Cameo. Or cameo. Yeah. yeah. Which is so funny. I didn't awesome. know it was you. You must have not yeah. mentioned yeah. Uh, your connection. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, what did I? What did I do? You sang uh, "Happy Birthday" and uh, just told me to have a, a good birthday. And okay. Yeah. Um, I'd never yeah. gotten a cameo. You're my one and only cameo I've ever gotten. <laughs> yeah. You, it was kind of like, oh, it sounds like, uh, you know, the person who got this for you really cares about yeah, you kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which, at the, I mean, it was cool because that's when we really started um, healing. Mm -hmm. I think, like, our relationship was, like, pretty – hitting a pretty good stride at that yeah. specific point. Hmm. Um, which, like – so, for history, I uh, – when my dad got sick uh, and the internet was – getting really intense about my OnlyFans, I felt like I had to go to therapy. Like, there was nowhere for me to go other than therapy, it felt like. So I went, um, and I ended up seeing a therapist that I got really lucky. She did EMDR, and uh, she happened to be a family therapist and a trauma therapist. And Ian just came up in passing, and she was like, oh, do you want some, like, homework like she was like well he, would he be willing to come in and at the time he definitely wasn't um so she was like oh do you want like some homework and so she started giving me homework and uh at the time he wasn't very like open to it he was like yeah whatever and then I found you and we started watching you and you kind of like bridged the gap for him where he was like oh like this is what therapy kind of is mm. and then that's when yeah I think for me like I I went on your podcast and one of the things that you had mentioned was specifically like, oh, it seems like you're like 5% there or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, how do we get these people who are 0% there to like start their journey kind of mm -hmm. thing? Yeah. And I was thinking like you really do in some ways need a little bit of incentive. I think for me having a partner like that obviously helps because it's now like I'm thinking about someone other than myself and it you know, I need to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I think for me that like that kind of the gateway, the gateway drug to like maybe thinking therapy isn't uh, horseshit. So, <laughs> so I'm like marijuana. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and your therapist is like heroin. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And uh, it was just, you know, seeing uh, essentially just watching the the reality TV and these relationships play out. A lot of people uh you know, I think come to it. I think one of the best ways that someone can arrive there, I think, is just watching these shows kind of on your own and forming like an idea of like who's in the right and who's in the wrong as mm -hmm. you go through it. Yeah. And then maybe seeing the the third person perspective of mm -hmm. you or, you know, a, to be honest, a lot of other people. It's surprising how split people are. Uh, when they watch these couples on 90 Day Fiance. I'm always surprised by it. We'll I'm get to the end and we're like, what the hell? Why does everyone hate Jasmine or I, something? I don't know why everyone hates Jasmine. <laughs> I feel so bad. Um, like it, yeah. that one specifically. No, the one that actually got me was Larissa. Mm -hmm. I don't know why everyone hates Larissa. Mm. It feels so bad. When I actually got really uh, triggered during her, um, the... Uh, the recap, not the recap, but where they're all the tell all, the tell all, the way that they all jumped on Larissa. I, there were many times where I had to like stop watching it because it just felt so like I was confused how people could arrive there. But it's true. Like everyone has their things that they don't like and, and the life that they've lived. So they react to things differently. Whereas I think with me, I see someone like Larissa and I'm like, she's trying so hard. Mm -hmm. And nobody's giving her any grace. Mm -hmm. And I 
imagine that's for a lot of people when they, you know, like someone on these reality TV shows, that's really what it is, Mm -hmm. is they're going, they're trying, I know what they're trying to do and no one is like Mm -hmm. hearing them. Yeah. And it's uh, familiar, feels familiar. Maybe the way Colt was treating her can feel, even if you don't know exactly where it's coming from, the, the theme is very familiar. You, you can relate, yeah. even though another viewer might not see any evidence of Larissa trying. Mm. Uh, you can see the humanity behind the behavior. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I try to, um, you know, portray or spread that notion is that I relate to all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you're a therapist, and I don't know if you're old and you pay attention to such things, you can see a lot of different presentations and people that are very easily labeled as like they're a problem and uh, uh, they're a narcissist or whatever. And then when you finally hear the backstory, like the way a therapist does with people, you slowly learn that every almost everyone has a backstory that is undetectable if you aren't paying attention. It's yeah. a lot of assuming, you know. So... Yeah. And I interface with the public and the, you know, the people who watch the channel in that way. And it was actually Larissa. I remember when I was talking about the two of them, that was, that was a big moment for me reading the comments because Mm -hmm. I wasn't, um, I wasn't going after Colt in the way that people wanted me to. Mm. Um, but then there were other people in the comment section because I, I came into that storyline like a couple years after it had already aired. There had already been a few seasons. And in the first season that they're on, it's pretty clear that they were leaving stuff out. They were making yeah. Larissa look bad yep. and they're making Colt look great. Yeah. So I was just commenting on what I was seeing, you know, and I usually try to say, I, I don't really know what's happening. I'm just totally. watch, watching an edit. Jumping you know. off points, yeah. basically, which is very helpful. I think the way that you put it of like, hey, I'm not saying this is what this person is. This is just like a jumping off point to discuss this thing, which was very helpful for me. I think uh, you said it and also my therapist said this and it changed my life, to be honest, is um, most people, uh, the majority of people don't wake up trying to hurt other people. Like once you like actually start to uh, internalize that, it it gives you a, a piece that I think that I was really lacking uh, for a long time. And I think like, um, so you did a podcast with Ian and I listened to some of it. And the, the question that you asked him, and I thought it was very interesting is like, if you were trying to convince people that you have a heart, like you, when you were at that time, like, you know, um, that you're not this person, you don't want to hurt people. Like, what would Anissa say about you? Mm-hmm. And so, what would Anissa say? As I, I honestly, I was talking to him about this this morning. He, Ian, it's really interesting because he, I think, is somebody who cares probably more than most people about other people, uh, and he cares about the world and what's right, and he wants to like make everything fair and and represent and protect people. Like I, at his Mm. core, that's who he is. But the lens that he was looking at that through was very warped based on his personal experiences and also very buried under a lot of things where like Ian used to live his life, at least in our relationship, uh, not showing much at all. And then he would have these big outbursts of feelings. So it was really hard to deny that he um, wasn't feeling all of these things. It was just very like muted and in the lens of like, I want to help and I want to like, he just, he had a mission and and believe, and he's still that way. I mean, you're very Mm -hmm. like, you really care about people. Yeah. And I think protecting. Y- yeah. And I think uh, when specifically answering that question, I think what may- makes it so hard for me is because I am kind of at this point in my life kind of um, uh, I think stuck in kind of a little bit – not stuck, but I am in like a little bit of a middle ground of like I, I really badly want to explain to 
uh, people who were in my position or are in my position, I want to give them the tools and tell them how I arrived where I did so they don't, so it doesn't seem like out of character or wild that I made these choices. But there is also the other side where it's like, you know, convincing everyone else that like I was being or like I, I did care about people back when I was making those videos. Can I ask, so when you started to have the thoughts that would eventually result in you uh, making videos, content along those lines, like anti-PC culture, yeah, uh, was that at uh, underneath it that care for fairness, that you would see people being attacked or yourself being attacked? or you're worried that people are going to be attacked unfairly? Yes. I think one of the first content cops, the reason I made it is uh, is because of this guy who is making very unfair content and putting people in very like, uh, you know, tabloid positions and, you know, like making them feel like they're either being attacked or they're being canceled um, for kind of whatever. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I don't like this. And he even did it to me uh, a couple of times. And I was like, I hate this feeling. I hate that he's doing it. Uh, this needs to be addressed because no one was addressing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that's where it came from a bit. If we asked you back then, does this generate from care and empathy, what would you have said? I, oh, I, I think I would say yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think that's – it's really weird, but what I fell in love uh, – the reason why I fell in love with him was because of how much he cared and had beliefs and like really wanted to, to stand up for those beliefs. And like he still is that way. Um, and I find it really interesting that the people who used to love him for that, for saying what he believed in, no matter how it was received, uh, they now hate him for that. Uh, because it really is that he believes these things and he wants to like walk the walk. It's the reason why like he did a charity boxing event. It's the reason why he made the apology video. It's the reason why he, uh, you know, tried to have conversations with different groups that like he affected. Um, he, you are someone who goes a hundred percent when you believe something and you want to help and like protect. Um, and I, I think that that's something that even in our relationship, when we were having difficulties, I think part of it, like the conversation of like, nobody wakes up wanting to hurt people, even when he was shut off or he was having those like days, um, I would remember that I've seen him really care. It's just, it wasn't all the time, or maybe it came out hurtful or painful to others, but it wasn't with the intention of being hurtful. Um, and I think that really helped. Yeah. Because um, it, it was very loud, mm -hmm. your care. It was yeah. just not all the time. So, uh, Anissa, so I'm trying to resist calling you Anfisa. Because uh, like <laughs> <laughs> like talking about 90 Fiance. Um, uh, what did you see or what would be your story or narrative as to why he changed? We talked about on the on the podcast about why you think you changed, you know, mm. but uh, why do you think he changed? Um, so I think he saw me go through a lot on the internet. Um, and I think it started to, I think he started to understand what it meant to kind of put, like what eye for an eye actually meant, or like when you think that you're being fair or balanced, like, uh, what it can do to the person that you're directing that energy at. Um, he used to, I think you were a Go little, at, well, <laughs> he used to tell me at the time that it was my problem and that I need to suck it up. Um, and then the OnlyFans drama happened. Well, can we drill on that? Cause that's a common thing. Yeah. W why do you think you were doing that at the time? Um, He's telling me to suck it up basically. Right. Um, because that was, I think in a lot of ways, I just did not uh, experience that side of things. And it really uh, benefited me online because I didn't share any of my life or anything. Uh, like that idea of sucking it up is definitely something that I felt like I did. And it benefited me. Like, obviously, I wasn't being fair in my comparisons. Like if someone leaves a hate comment for me back then, it's like, lol, loser. 
It's not, you know, 12 paragraphs. Was the, uh, you know, my hypothesis is that due to your upbringing from good parents, but given the stresses, Mm -hmm. there was a potential lack of attunement and uh, disconnection from your emotions. What does that mean, attunement? Uh, Attunement of parents is when they notice your emotional state enough of the time. And number two, they also respond well most of the time. So you, your dad was in prison and your mom is stressed out, single mom, hard to uh, survive really. And so there could have been a lot of time where you were provided for and loved, but it was a stressed out system. And so you kind of had to figure stuff out on your own. And for kids in that situation, you know, we're talking two, three years old, they will have emotional experiences, but they don't know how to interpret them. They just feel overwhelming and difficult. And if they're signaling and no one comes, they just, uh, there's a very, there's various different coping skills that children will resort to. One of which is just to shut the whole system down, try to, it's still happening. The emotions are still happening, but when you um, have enough of that, and then as an adult, you can feel like you're a psychopath, like Mm. you don't have emotion, but you do. (laughs) Now, some people are psychopaths and don't have uh, that kind of empathy or that kind of response, but way more often it's because of what we call avoidant attachment. Um, And so when she's going through this, um, commonly, you know, don't let me put thoughts in your mind, but you feel responsible, you love her, you don't want her to suffer and you're watching her suffer. And it would be a faster road to her not suffering in your head if she just ignores it or forgets about it or, um, you know, tries to persevere. Um, And often as partners, we'll feel responsible, right? Because that's our job is to support our partners. And if we don't have any resources and our typical way is to avoid, then we might say to someone in a hurtful way, uh, suck it up. Yeah. Do you think that I don't want to put, I'm putting, no, I think that's, yeah, I think, yeah, it's it's for the most part it. It's also super interesting because I, I think that you're correct that like he didn't know what was going on, but I did like, I could feel when yeah, that he was, was upset. Yeah, that was is something interesting. I'm now uh, a little bit more in tune with how I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, back then, yeah. like it was an energy. And she's even said like, man, back then you used to give me this look and I knew exactly like what was going on. Yeah. Uh, I knew that you were like on the verge of blowing up or. Yeah. Well, because the thing with him is it, it would be nothing and then a hundred Right. So in terms of display, display. Right. Yeah. Which like I learned over time, there were small and I, uh, I had a therapist tell me that I have hypervigilance from my upbringing, which, you know, I uh, have PTSD from when I was five, I uh, went into septic shock. I almost died. Hmm. Um, My parents said goodbye to me. It was a big thing. Uh, I that's what I got EMDR for, which um, really helped. I uh, used to have, um, I would get triggered by any form of abandonment, basically, and I would go into five-year-old brain, Mm. which for him was horrible, obviously. That was like a really- I was always trying to like logic it out, and I'm like, man, what the hell? She isn't listening to my logic and my reason. (laughs) Could not get Uh, it to work at all. But it did finally click when she did explain, like, I was going into five-year-old mode. I'm like, oh, yeah, like- that's literally what it if was. If that's what it is, then what am I doing trying to like, Logic. you know, give you a list of like, you know, <laughs> things to why yeah. it's not a problem or whatever. Um, but I, I process that pretty, pretty well. And I, I do have, uh, I guess, some CP, CPTSD and some other things. Um, but I've gotten a lot better with those things. Um, but the hypervigilance, I could tell when he was about to blow up. To the point where we were even on, um, it was Graham Stephan's podcast, and you guys started talking about the housing mm-hmm. landlords. Yeah. And I could tell, you know, he wasn't showing anything, but I was like, I think we need to stop this conversation because I could tell it was like getting to that point. Yeah. Noticing your emotional state before you did? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, but now it's it's crazy. Um, 
you haven't had any blow ups for four years. I think something like that, four or five years. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't had any issues with like abandonment. Abandonment. Kind of stuff. I, I, it's so you've talked about it actually on one of your podcasts. It's the attachment or the um, complexes. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a therapist work with me. This is the craziest thing that's ever happened to me in therapy, but she, she was like, okay, I'm going to read a list of statements mm. and one of them is going to make you feel something. Mm. And when it does, like, let me know. And I was thinking to myself, like, okay, like, whatever. She's reading all these things and she gets to the, um, uh, I am unlovable, therefore I deserve to be abandoned. And I just started bawling. Mm. Like, that was it. Yeah. Um, schemas is what we call Yeah, it. schemas. That's, yeah. yeah. And uh, to, to have that, like, reaction and to realize, like, okay, this is what's, going on with me and working through that. And I think me working on that, even though he wasn't working on his stuff, me calming down to the point where I just was less, I feel like I'm a lot more sentient now. Whereas before it was just, it was acting off of like almost instinct. Mm -hmm. um, and I find it so interesting that when I started like working on these things and our relationship started getting better um, and he started having space to figure out who he was and I had space to figure out who I was, that's when the internet started really having a problem with our relationship and really having a problem with him. And I find it ironic that when we were actually at our unhealthiest, that's when your career was mm -hmm. doing the best. And it's because his uh, avoidant tendencies were to work on videos. Yeah. And to, to be on the internet and be involved in drama and, and occupy his brain with other things because he it was better than, you know, working on what yeah. we had going on. And I, I will mention as well, just because I think it, it often gets lost in these discussions, I think, is the idea that, like, your brain could honestly, like, revolve entirely around strategy yeah. when you're thinking about, like, you know, what is best for you online. Yeah. And I think I had that problem where a lot of things were like, well, it's going to be best for me online if if I, you know, either remain this way or, you know, uh, don't address certain things that need to be yeah. addressed. Well, um, and put yourself aside for the strategy. Yeah. Right? yeah. Get views regardless of what's going on with me in yeah. my marriage or do I even want to be making mm -hmm. this kind of content. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, weren't even questions. Um, but I guess to go back to your original question, which was like, why do I think he changed? I think that um, once the OnlyFans drama happened and it started coming at him at the level that it was coming at me, because I, I was getting like my parents' house got doxxed at one point. They were laughing at my dad for getting sick on some of these forums, like just like really horrendous stuff. Yeah. And once it started getting directed at both of us and it was this wave, almost like a, a, a content cop level wave of hate that usually would be sent someone else's way. When he received that, I think his brain like had to like acknowledge like, holy shit, this is what this is what it is. This is what it's like. And it and it was in the space that he used for avoidance, right, online. That's where, like, he would escape. So once it was there and it was inescapable, that's kind of when I think things started. My yeah, the dad was started sick. turning. Yeah. That was the other thing. My, my dad got sick. And at the time, again, I think it was an avoidance strategy. He was like, oh, your dad's fine. He's just getting older. And my dad's not, my dad got diagnosed with early onset at 56. Mm. So he's now 61 and his mind is like gone pretty much. Um, and I, and this is, I love, like, it's not. Yeah, shoot. No, I, it, it <laughs> sucks because it, you wanted to help me. Uh -huh. And so you're, you. He, well, I, yeah, I, I've oftentimes uh, coped by being yeah. optimistic about things yeah. uh, and in a lot of ways just being very like naive yeah. and like. Well, the analogy, this is just the way I think, is mm -hmm. that you're four and you're lonely like overall and you don't have any way of helping yourself with that because you're four. You don't even necessarily consciously know. And so 
your solution was to be optimistic, to think everything will be fine because it's the only way to think. If I focus on negativity or if I even acknowledge what's happening, I'll just feel worse. So mm. I'll just say everything's fine. Everything will be fine. Just keep moving forward. And when someone else comes along that you care about, that's suffering, then you know, you're know you going yeah. to say, this is what works for me. Just stuff it and move forward. <laughs> yeah. Which well, is, I, I don't want to, it just, that's what I would imagine might be happening for you. I'm not yeah. saying that's what's happening of for course. you. But that's the way I think is that all of our defenses as adults are developed. It's not yeah. my idea. It's basically Freud's idea, but mm -hmm. yeah. developed when we're very young. Yeah. And it uh, uh, makes a lot of sense to me when we look at things that way. Because it's like why, in the same way, no one wakes up in the morning and says, I want to be a jerk face. No one wakes up in the morning and says, I want to cause emotional strife yeah. by avoiding feelings. Um, there's some defense, there's some schema, there's some pattern, there's some assumption, some fear. You know? Yeah. I think it's also overcompensating for, I'm an incredibly negative person. Um, and it's a lot of internal negative talk. Uh, and I think that he wants to counterbalance my, like, doom. I'm very, like, that doom is heavy. True. Does it help to do that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely a coping. Part of it is, like, uh, my whole family is very negative. But on top of that, like, we weren't really, it wasn't uh, acceptable to show emotion when I was growing up. So I internally, it just was mean to myself and would talk to myself really horribly. Mm. And uh, that's definitely translated into adulthood. So he hears me being negative and talking negative to myself and about things all the time that, you know, this news of like my dad getting sick at, at 56, I think his brain was just like, there was no way, right? Like that can't, you're just being overly negative about the situation. So, you know, going through the pain of like losing my dad and, and him seeing that happen the OnlyFans stuff, dealing with, like, seeing in his face, like, this thing, um, I think something in his brain, kind of like me with my dad getting sick in the OnlyFans drama, something in his brain was like, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This isn't going to work. Yeah, that's what you were saying, right? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So I think yeah, that's when get, things started. You sort of get pushed into a wall, um, and, like, if the ideology that you've been holding on to that I was holding on to doesn't have any answers for the situation you're currently in. It's kind of like, well, have I had this? I sort of question myself if I had this wrong the whole time, like, you know, I maybe need to rethink some things. Yeah. Well, and it's like I said to you last time, it's commendable. One, there's a lot of commendable things <laughs> that the two of you are saying and the uh, choices that you make and the grace you give each other, the grace you give yourself. Thank you. Uh, it's, um, you know, uh, 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 your role models for a lot of people, I'm sure. And the cognitive dissonance that happens, right? It's like, oh, these are my fans. The, we're in alignment. We're mm -hmm. an in-group. And wait, they're, uh, they're making me, but particularly my partner, feel terrible. Normally, I'd be behind my crowd. But now, what do I do? And you could have said, they're right. And, uh, you know, turn to any sense, say, you're overreacting, you're being too negative. Um, but you chose a completely different route that had a lot of barriers and a lot of consequences. Um, and especially back then, you'd have no idea what was going to happen, right? That, right. Yeah. Uh, you could have been even targeted more. Someone could have shown up at, yep. at your house and, um, you know, literally killed you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but at the very least, uh, losing your career, you know, losing your purpose, losing your work, losing a lot of money. So um, to make that choice that I don't know, I mean, I, I can't think of anyone else off the top of my head anyway who – given that cognitive dissonance would make that choice you know it's it's a it's a commendable thing it uh, and that example i think should be highlighted yeah regardless of what it is you know it, not just turning to 
less anti PC culture kind of stuff, but that ability to uh, reevaluate and to take that leap because of, I don't know, well, would you say it was morality or care for Anissa or you saw the light or how would you characterize it? I mean, I, it's so hard because as you say all those things, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I do feel like it's kind of all of it. Um, Morally, how? Mo like, uh, when it, you, yes, that it was a moral decision. Yeah. How was it moral? Uh, how was it moral? Um, I felt like the right thing to do. Like, there's nothing in my body that could, like, I would be lying to myself and all the things I believe in if I were to continue to go in the direction that I was going. Like what do you believe in that was being challenged? Like, um, I don't know, like sticking up for my partner. This is the person that I've like kind of dedicated myself to. Uh. And, you know, we have agreed that we are, you know, like we blindly stick up for her or uh, stick up for her when it's right to do so. Yeah. When it's right to do why, so. Why was it right? Why was it right? Uh, Cause she's being hurt. And unfairly. I don't like, yeah, unfairly. Yeah. And I didn't like seeing that. And yeah. it hurt me to see that. Sounds like empathy, folks. <laughs> just want to highlight Thanks that. Thanks for walking me through that. It felt uncomfortable. That's <laughs> really? Yeah. Why? I love, see, I love, no, this is good because <laughs> I have this problem where I talk for us. Yeah. I've always had that problem. Mm -hmm. um, and she's I, doing it now. I'm doing it now. <laughs> but that's why I love that you're in therapy because yeah. I think that I'm getting you, better at it. Yeah. Have, having no choice but to confront it head on. It's like really like, OK, fuck. Uh, Anissa's not here. Uh, what do I say? <laughs> uh, and yeah, I don't know. I, I, that's also another thing. Like as you're describing this, like very much get in my own head. You you mention morality, like how is it moral for you? And I'm like, fuck, I'm like running through the definitions of moral in my head. And I'm like, what is the answer he's looking for? What is the correct answer here? <laughs> um, yeah, obviously you weren't, that wasn't the intention. You know, you're trying to get to the bottom of what I'm trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Um, so it's feels uncomfortable because you feel like you're going to fuck it up. Yeah, I'm just, I don't know. The way I've been operating like on my YouTube channel and stuff for so long has been that I, I have done very little that is like unprepared uh, and hyper edit things as well and give myself plenty of time to think about things and do all this stuff. So I don't know, speaking from the heart or any of that stuff is just, it is a learning curve. There's a learning curve. Mm -hmm. well, and it's in my view, and there's evidence that this is neurological because you know, this is, I'll just keep repeating it, but the way I see it is, you know, neurologically, right. you as a child fail to develop those connections sufficiently and or ignored it sufficiently such that it, uh, the neurons kind of uh, stopped being connected, but you're um, getting that connection. Uh, he shared a story on or off the podcast, I can't remember, that you now notice you're like, oh, I think I'm having an emotion. You're not fully aware of what it is, but you'll say to Anissa or someone else, maybe it's mainly Anissa, um, I think I'm having an emotion. I don't know what it is. And then you explore it. That's that, you know, that's that burgeoning connection down the road. You'll mm -hmm. be able to say, I think I'm feeling X or, or, and then down the road, you'll be like, I'm definitely feeling X. Is there some like primary, emotions because i i think i mentioned to you like i would feel frustrated it's yeah. like is frustrated an emotion or yeah. are they're like sure i mean it depends on the language system but the if you're asking like what to look for it's hurt and fear you know we're mm. like any other organism that takes in information uh, emotions are uh, you know evolved to uh, keep us to survive to help us survive and also to procreate and so it's very helpful to know when we're hurt, when someone's stabbing us in the leg with something, you know, we, we need to register that and react. Um, we're social animals, which means in all likelihood in our past, other primates as well, um, co-opted that physical hurt and the fear of being eaten as a way to motivate behavior socially, because in order to survive, 
we also, as a social, you know, that that's a big part of our ability to survive is mm. to um, be in a pack, a tribe, a, a herd, um, and to seek approval and to be very upset if we're being rejected because in the olden times, that could literally mean you're left behind and then you're, you literally get in. We like to think of ourselves as the top of the predator pyramid, but, or the food chain, but we are, we are not. No. There's yeah. all this evidence that we were regularly eaten by lions and jaguars and, and tigers and, you know. All the big cats. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, hyenas as well. Oh they, man, that would suck. They have yeah. all this, you know, these bones. There's this one cave that's sort of in the ground in Africa and they unearthed all these human bones. Mm. And the idea is that there must have been a tree um, near the cave and the cats would drag us into the trees, eat us, and then the bones, the debris would fall into this cave. Um, you know, there are countless other trees that were probably experiencing the same thing, but because the bones didn't go into a cave, they weren't preserved. And you just it just paints a picture, you know? Mm. And so we were very... Uh, incentivized evolutionary wise to make sure that everyone loves us and we're very oriented that way. Yeah. And so when you're with Anissa and you feel a sense that maybe you're being rejected or there's a threat that she will leave you eventually, then it will produce hurt or fear because that's supposed to motivate us to react. And if you haven't been guided around that, and most people haven't, which keeps people like me employed, by the way, then you don't know what to do. And you, you'll develop all these weird defenses or interpretations. So when you're frustrated, um, if the question I would ask myself is, what could I possibly be hurt by right now? Meaning my feelings are hurt, meaning I feel like someone is putting me down or treating me badly and or what am I afraid of? And it's usually irrational. It's, it's, it's like um, you're deciding what a TV show to watch and Anissa's like, I don't want to watch that show and you really want to watch the show. Um, it's not rational to conclude that she's going to divorce you because she doesn't approve of your TV <laughs> show. But because we're like hyper social and hyper approval seeking because uh, apparently it was very important to us to uh, err on the side of caution regarding approval from our tribe, then we'll have that feeling. And uh, uh, so that would be the question that I was, and then you could just say, right. um, Anissa, because you don't want to watch Dragon Ball Z, my feelings are hurt. <laughs> <laughs> that happens to me actually with him. He doesn't want to watch my animes and I get sad. Okay. Yeah. So, but we'll watch Naruto again eventually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <For sure>. Definitely. <laughs> um, I do have to say it's interesting the feeling of rejection and isolation being like very uh, primitive because I have to say the online um, abandonment uh, feels like of uh -huh. both other YouTubers and viewers has been the most painful. And I've been through a lot physically and emotionally. Yeah. The most painful thing we have ever been through. Because of what happened and. Yeah. And then all the other YouTubers attacking you. Yeah. Yeah. There was just a lot of conversation and a lot of like, it was weird to have people discuss whether or not we were making a good choice. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, and assuming that we didn't talk to each other and this wasn't like a fully, um, it was, it was really frustrating because it was around the time that we got really good at communicating and like making space for each other and like what each other needed. Mm -hmm. So to have people like be like, he's not happy with it. He hates it. It yeah. was, it was very painful. Cause it's like, wh why are you saying that? You don't even know us. Yeah. Um, there were like podcasts discussing it and stuff. Um, it was, it was very weird. Yeah. Um, and hard. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I can't imagine yeah. I've been through like 1% occasionally what the two of you have been through. And, yeah, I, I can't sleep at night. Yeah. I avoid through various different problematic vices of some sort. Mm -hmm. I get in a bad mood around my wife. It's horrible. Yeah. Anissa has like uh, described because she did, uh, uh, what do you do? You did lacrosse, men's lacrosse. Yeah, and lacrosse hockey. and hockey. 
And she always told me, because I wasn't in team sport, she was always saying how it feels so much worse to uh, lose a game than it felt good to win yes, kind of thing. I agree. Yeah. And I feel like that's the same thing when it comes to your like presence online, like the, you know, Obviously, for every 20 positive comments, the one comment holds about as much as pa a power as mm -hmm. the 20 negative ones and yeah. uh, or positive ones. And uh, I think that is also true for the just the waves of hate. It doesn't even if it's just yeah. one day or a small controversy, it's so much worse yeah. than like a legacy or multiple years of doing well, doing pretty good. Yeah. yeah. You would think of all people, the two of you would be able to what they you know, call it, you'd have thick skin, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and every time, Conan O'Brien actually was the tipping point for me because I, as a content provider for 15 years, I would have that experience and it was not rational. I get, I mean, especially the content I have, I don't get that many negative comments. And I'm also old and I've been through a lot of fucking therapy. Yeah. And I don't care about someone's random opinion. I'm not fragile like that, but... I found myself really being affected. And I thought, and I would ask other, you know, content providers, including even my co-hosts, and they'd be like, yeah, you know, just moving on, who cares? Just just let it roll off your back, you know, any publicity is good publicity, or you know, look at all the nice comments, you know, you're gonna throw a wide net. Some people are gonna think you're stupid, you know, just let it go, and you know, and I'm like, okay, and I tried to do that, and it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. And then I heard Conan O'Brien talk about years ago how he, doesn't even read comments or reviews if he hasn't for decades. Yeah. And I thought, well, if Conan, because he seems so uh, confident and beloved and capable and successful, he can't read his comments. And then I, uh, William Osmond, for example, mm. um, he came out with uh, that the video. video. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a couple years ago. And you know, he talked about how he was being attacked. And similarly, you think, well, you know, usually younger people know they grew up with the internet. They understand it's it's more, they're more accustomed to it. And he just completely gave up his entire career, essentially, and just shut down the channel. Over a million subscribers, mm -hmm. every video was getting a lot of views and he had sponsors, you know, he's making a living. And then he just said, I... I'm closing up shop and mm. he's, he's never returned. I mean, he has like a side thing that he kind of does, mm. but um, he just, he just walked away and I, I thought, okay, you know, not, and, and as a, the end of that video that he talked, he talked with a lot of his friends. Did he talk with you? I don't think so. Okay. No. Yeah. Because I didn't know you back then. And so, he, but anyway, he talked to a lot of his friends and a lot of them were basically saying that, uh, you know, they struggle with it, but, they had various different ways of coping with it. And I kept thinking, well, maybe Conan O'Brien, William Osmond, and me are like in this minority. But the more I talk with people, the more I think all that bravado and that thick skin claim is just them trying to convince themselves. I agree because I am telling you, I've been doing this for 10 years and it has always been horrendous. Everything that you describe, I deal it doesn't, with. Yeah, it doesn't majorly. build up. It's no, like, yeah. it's not like, oh yeah, the skin is becoming thicker with no. time. No. It, it gets, it gets thinner. Yeah, yeah it I does. Think. Yeah. I, I think also like people get really creative with comments, like the ones where they're like basically writing out what they, like even us talking to you today, I, I was really nervous about it because people online love diagnosing me with BPD. They love telling me I have BPD yeah. or just straight up narcissism. I was telling my therapist this actually the other day. Some guy in my Instagram comments was like, I'm a psychology student and Anissa is a textbook narcissist. And she just laughed. She was like, the, there are yeah. so many layers to why that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like when you get these comments again and again, like I'm like, man, we're going to talk to Kirk and I'm going to share that I struggle with anxious attachment style. And people are going to be like, BPD. Mm. And she did ruin his career and she did like, she, look at all these horrible, she's abusing him. I, there's a lot of like claims of abuse that I, you know, so these comments, like they don't, they don't go away. I think it, over time they actually build up inside of you. Mm -hmm. um, well, what do you do? Because for me, I am very selective about 
so I, I, I uh, so uh, at some point I just decided I can't read any comments or emails or anything, Yeah, which really sucked because especially on a channel like mine, it was probably like 500 positive or neutral comments to every negative. And I, I couldn't interact. I couldn't get really any sort of feedback. Uh, so I eventually decided I just, I, I don't want to, there's got to be another Susan. So I hired my uh, brother's kid, mm. <laughs> Alina, who I had on the podcast recently, and they uh, were tasked with, among a lot of things, um, screening comment sections and other kinds of things and then giving me the okay. Mm. And uh, so Alina looks over the top comments and and determines if it's okay for me to look at it. And then I uh, will be told that and then I'll go look. You know, uh, 99% of the time, it's fine. Um, and it's funny because sometimes Alina will say, uh, don't look at the comment section here. Yeah. And even though Alina is telling me there's bad things there. I do that too. If I don't read it, yeah. it doesn't affect me. Yeah. Just just sort of knowing it's there, yeah. but having not had it enter my brain. I know it's when I you read it. I just go on with my day. But if I saw even just one, like there was recently someone sent me a thing on Reddit. They're, they're, oh, God, they're, Reddit. They're, they're talking about you. And- um, I looked at the, you know, the, the thread and it was positive and I was c sort of scrolling down like an idiot. And then, <laughs> and then someone, someone said, uh, so they were posting, I think about love is blind and, and someone, this was, I don't know, like three weeks ago, it's still rattling around in my head, rent free. Uh, someone said, I don't agree with a single thing that that guy says <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> And, and on its face, it's so stupid because I've been, you know, I have, I've been podcast 15 years. I put out uh, somewhere on the order of 25 episodes a week to some extent, you know, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I've yammered a lot. There's literally nothing <laughs> you've ever heard from me <laughs> that you have agreed with. It's so dumb. It yeah. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And yet it. It got under my skin. I start to second guess things I say. I start to pre-apologize on the, on the air. Yeah. I start having less passion or motivation to even make content, and it's yeah. so dumb, you know. Because, uh, so I I am, uh, 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 you know, my perspective is, I can't get away from my evolution. I can't get away from my limbic system. Yep. Uh, we aren't made for that kind of uh, environment. Uh, when we were with our hundred or fifty people on the African savanna during the Pleistocene, three hundred thousand years ago, there was no comment section. You just had to deal with fifty people. That one, you know, there's not many of them. Two, they've known you since you were born. So if you fuck up, they're like, "Well, that's the exception." Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Also, I can't just blast this person because if I do, they might reject me and everyone else. So I have to be tempered if I'm going to give any sort of feedback. Right. right. And so we evolved in my estimation in that environment. So the occasional negative feedback was occasional and within context. Also in that environment, you could correct for it. That's, yes. what, that's what I figured out. It's like, yeah. I don't mind, you know, someone, I've had clients tell me that I'm like one of the worst people on the planet. It happens. I mean, there's transference and we encourage that. And I'm right. the sort of therapist that encourages it. And, and I, I fully expect that to happen. If they're with one of their parents were a whole repulver person, then. You also worked with very extreme, like you at one point were working with court mandated DV uh, perpetrators. perpetrators. Yeah. So like, I'm sure you got a yeah. lot of, yeah. 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 So uh, uh, I'm okay with extreme negative energy towards me. The difference is online. I can't interact. I would with yes, most of these people. I, I just know. I just want to say, you know, to that person who said that, yeah. I just want to say, cool, you know, we, we don't have to agree. And if I could have that just exchange I agree. in the moment and and also have it be viewed by all the other people that are like looking at that comment. Yep. Uh, then I, I would sleep easy. But it's just that that dig that just goes yeah. out into the ether and you're, you can't respond. It's just 
living there. And you know, I'm sure people listening right now, if you're not a content provider um, or somehow you have 100% positive uh, <laughs> feedback, uh, you're thinking, what's wrong with these people? And I, I'm telling you, as a professional, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you. So, like, no, in, I, this is just my guess. I, I don't know. I don't. At, at the uh, U of A, uh, I went to the University of Alberta in uh, Canada. They have a professor ratings where you can like give professor ratings and like give little blurbs, yeah. right? And some of the professors really got it, right? There was like some people that would be like, "This is literally the worst professor ever. Don't take this fucking class." Mm. Did uh, at the university where you're you taught at? Did you have professor ratings? Yeah. Well, one, there used to be ratemyprofessor.com. That's what it is, ratemyprofessor.com. Um, which I didn't have any negative okay. feedback there. But, you know, we – there were very few students that would actually – Use it. Yeah. And I, although one of them – they so they would ask you like four questions like how good was the professor and um, did they impart knowledge? But one of the questions was how hard are they? And uh, like a – uh, the the three, you know, it's one through five. The number three was they're balanced. Mm. So it, uh, uh, but five, like good, was they're super easy. Mm. Oh, and I'm like, confusing. who wants, especially in grad school, you know, people paying thousands of dollars, yeah. multiple thousands of dollars just to take my stupid class. Yeah. Uh, who wants it to be? A five. Like easy, easy. I know. Anyway. Um, but the thing that would really get to me was at the end of the quarter, there would be these evaluations, you know, that people would, the students would fill out on all of us. And um, as professors, you know, we'd read those naturally. And that would really get to me too. Um, yeah. It would, it would, like I said, and I, and I would notice, because I've been a professor my entire career as a therapist, and I would notice that if a client hated me and even fired me, said, I don't want to work with you anymore, uh, you know, Obviously, I took it seriously, but it, mm. I wouldn't lose sleep over it. Um, but something about a student or a listener, I don't know. It, it, I, I've explored it a lot. I could bore you with all the details, but I can't imagine what the two of you went through. And yeah. it, I, I, I feel really bad for what you are going to continually. So how do you – do you read every comment? <laughs> that was my original <laughs> question. So the thing is, and what makes me kind of sad about all of this is like – I wanted to get him to share more. Like as our relationship went on, I share a lot. He's wanted me to share less. I've wanted him to share more. We've started to meet in the middle. Um, but as he shared more, he gets punished online for it. Do you read all the comments though? Uh, he does and is fine. I won't Not say fine, fine <laughs> but way better than me. Yeah. I yeah. I'm the problem. I think there's, yeah, it's, I mean, I would describe it kind of, she's described it a little bit like body dysmorphia, where it's like if you're looking yourself in the mirror for a little too long, you can get a little bit really down on yourself. Mm. You know, you read one negative comment, and you're like, all right, let's find another one. Yeah. <laughs> and you keep going. Yeah. Uh, it's weird. It, it, it definitely hurts, and I can get caught in that. Um, uh, I think what helps me is to kind of create a little bit of a, a policy kind of thing and treat it, try to be as robotic as possible if I need to look at the comment section. Mm -hmm. So like some other uh, content creators that I've talked to, they're like, yeah, look at the comments for the first 24 hours. Those are your biggest fans. Obviously, that at my point in us. my career, it's like the biggest fans and the biggest haters are out in the first 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Like they're going hard. Uh, but I did find that to be generally true. You, I, ha I have a lot more positive comments in the first. Do you – well, then all the uh, content that people made about you, does that live in your head? Yeah. For me, yeah. Knowing that there's hour-long videos breaking down – Yeah. A lot of – to be honest, like a lot of it was sarcasm from me, like making a joke. But they take it very seriously. I mean, even our podcast, like mm -hmm. I'm sure people will break this down and talk about – how horrible we are or whatever. But um, the the ones that get to me is when they take me making a joke or me just sh being very open and like being like, look, see, she's a piece of shit or she's embarrassing her husband. Recently, the thing was, I think I said that I shaved for OnlyFans or mm -hmm. something. And these people took the clip and they were like, she's embarrassing her husband. She doesn't even care what he thinks yeah. uh, about her uh, appearance or whatever. Um, do so. you try not to watch that stuff? I never do. Uh, I It took me 
two years because I used to do it compulsively. I, I like had to look at everything and yeah. it would ruin my week, month even sometimes. Yeah. And um, I got to the point where I was like, I literally cannot even look at it. But even thumbnails, if I see them accidentally, because sometimes- Oh, some of the thumbnails are juicy, man. Yeah. It kind of tells you all you need to know because yeah. they've like Photoshopped you to look like a snake. I'm green in one of them with yeah. snake eyes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's got like 550,000 views of yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I for me, uh, I will spiral. I'll have really bad weeks. Um, he's the rock. He's the one who like will. Well, I don't know. I mean, that that's the whole that's the whole question. The, yeah. Uh, uh, what's what's I Dub's really feeling? Yeah, that's the thing. And so I we should title this. <laughs> OK, it's Thank actually you. it's interesting because that is what um my main conversation with my therapist right now is like, I'm like, I know that Ian, I specifically brought, she knows who you are. Oh. So I was talking about, I was like, Kirk said he's only at 5%, which means I'm probably only at 5%. And <laughs> if that's true, uh, then like, there's all these things going on that we don't know about. Given and what I, you're saying, I mean, you know, it's just an arbitrary percentage, no. uh, but uh, I would say you're further down the road. Um, uh, people with that kind of coping style, like what you're describing can absolutely be a positive, a, yeah. a strength um, in, in the ways that you could imagine. Um, the reason why I was saying that, you know, Ian, you're 5% is because of my gauge of other clients that have mm -hmm. talked like you, where you're um, at that stage where you're saying occasionally there are times when you know, you're starting to notice when you're feeling something and you don't have a word for it. And it, the best word, that you can think of as frustration. Yeah. Um, and that's wonderful. It's better than 1%. <laughs> but I like the number though, because I no, want to. It's awesome. I want to gamify it. And I'm like, all right, how it's, can I maximize my stats? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also just so <laughs> cool because when he started doing it, um, just being like, I'm feeling something, that was enough for the blow ups to stop. Yeah. Like for him to acknowledge, like, I'm feeling something was the beginning of a very exciting and fast uh, progression where like those conversations, I mean, even now, like if he hasn't uploaded a video for a while, he'll be like, I'm feeling stressed. I'm yeah, stress and to today. be specific as to why this would help with that mm -hmm. typically is that as emotional creatures, uh, a big part of the soothing element or component of emotion is that when we act on the emotion, you know, if, a simple example is someone's poking you in the knee with a with a fork and it hurts um the motivation is to stop that to you know push it away or to mm. move away from the fork if you just sit there and mm. allow the fork to jab you in the knee it it it, it you know it's maddening right mm. um and then eventually you you blow up um the other element is that when as social creatures a big part of our uh, uh, happiness and well-being and, and equilibrium physically is when we have secure attachments, you know, when we're being accepted by the tribe, particularly the people close to us. And so when we have emotion, uh, apparently we evolved to seek understanding and, and um, uh, solidarity. Mm. And so to say, I think I'm feeling something, maybe frustration, and she attunes to you by maybe even noticing before you know, right? I think you're having an emotion. You're like, oh, I think I'm having an emotion. That, that sense of I'm not alone. I'm, you know, because in the past you could have had those feelings unbeknownst to you deep down. And the conclusion, given your defenses, the conclusion deep down that you're making is no one cares, but no one is, no one knows is the, is, is yeah. the real problem. Mm. But it can feel very, very isolating and very, very rejecting and, and very, very hurtful. And then that feeling builds and builds and builds. And then, you know, you're screaming at her in, in Canada and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 it, and you don't know why, you know, yeah. And, yeah. And, and she doesn't know why yeah. you're doing this. But it's coming from a very confused primal place of, nobody loves me mm. and I'm being treated like shit. Mm -hmm. um, mm. That's, that's, that's what I would 
guess as to what is happening. Yeah. Yeah. And that sort of stuff uh, can be learned as well, I imagine. From... That defense? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's definitely learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, when you were two, you did, weren't like that in all likelihood. You were just unbridled emotion, you know, like crying or bored or happy or whatever. And over time, it just wasn't attuned to enough at the time. And, and you just, you just, shut it down. We study children in the lab, 18 month, you know, 24 month old children. Um, we call it the strange situation where we'll have the parents, you know, like for example, with you, your mom could have brought you in to the lab and it's a whole elaborate kind of procedure. But the gist of it is the, uh, a researcher, another woman comes in and at first the child is like, who's the stranger? Cause that's normal. But there's also toys in the room. And then the mom leaves, the mom comes back. And what does the kid do? Mm. Because for securely attached children that are attuned to enough at the time, they will run to their mom and um, say, oh, mommy's here, yay. And maybe stick by mom and then go play with the toys. For avoidant kids, uh, they'll be playing with the toys. Mom walks in and they're like, hmm, anyway. But you can, they haven't fully developed the defense. So you can kind of see them wanting to go to mom, but they're no, don't, don't do that. Mm. That they, they don't have a lot of eye contact. They don't really interact with anybody. They're just sort of playing with their toys. They're just posting content on YouTube. <laughs> 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 um, and then the anxious kids, yeah. when mom walks in, the kids run to mom and scream and cry and say, I can't believe you left me. And then they hold on to mom's leg for a really long time, yeah. maybe for the rest of the experiment. And they actually never leave mom's side or go play with the toys. So um, when you think about that, when I think about that, and then you translate that into adult behavior, it, it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was super interesting. Um, you were talking about uh, on the podcast when you guys were talking that like typically in our situation, what happens is um, things get controlling or abusive and then the split happens. Uh, and I asked Ian this morning because I was so curious. I, I was like, do you ever feel like the relationship got controlling? And um, interestingly enough, I said I felt like I had control in the relationship, which is very interesting because I was definitely very anxious, a um, lot of crying, a lot of, uh, you know, just if if I felt like there was even a chance that he was going anywhere or upset with me or whatever, I was like really having a hard time. But I think it was it was internal hatred. It was never outward. So it was a lot of inward um, panicking. And I think the first time I had a breakthrough of like, I need to work on this was um, I, your mom is very awesome. I love your mom a lot. And um, he called me one time after we were together in Edmonton, he'd flown back home and he said, I don't want to talk to you for two weeks. Or no, you said, I don't want to talk to you and hung up the phone. And I was like, holy shit, this I'm what, what's going on? Like I was panicking. So I contacted his mom because we have a very good relationship. And I was like, I don't know what's going on. And she was like, he needs to know that you are going to like let him exist, that you're not going to like make this a problem, that he has the freedom to like do what he needs to do. And so she was like, do not contact him until he contacts you. And for two weeks, two weeks, uh, I managed to not reach out once. It was the hardest uh, mm -hmm. thing I had ever done. I literally felt like I was dying. I, cause like, that's what my therapist said. Like back when this happened to me that I had almost died, I, you know, you start to internalize this feeling of like abandonment means death. This is bad. Mm -hmm. But the two weeks I didn't contact him and he ended up contacting me, um, two weeks later. Yeah. I felt, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of relief and I was ready to, why did you want to do that? Uh, I think I just, you know, it's, uh, I think, um, I don't know, like, uh, I don't want to say like cliche words or anything, but feeling smothered or just feeling like there's too much. I was so used to steering my own ship, not having any responsibility other than to look out for myself. Was there a precursor buildup of her pursuing and you distancing that, um, not necessarily. That's a pretty extreme kind yeah, of. Yeah, I think it was. Well, we we it, our relationship was difficult in the beginning, mainly because the long distance. So when we you know visit each other, it would be like six months in Canada, six mm -hmm. months in the U.S., 
And uh, I don't know. I never lived with someone in that way. Yeah, you so, never lived with – you were very – even with your parents, you were left yeah, alone a lot. exactly. So I think it was – but I will say that – It felt like a lot. But, you know, me now, I'm able to say how little it was. Like I had plenty of time to myself and that was an extreme reaction for me. And I definitely wouldn't have given myself the advice to do something like that now. I think, though, I do agree that it, it did feel like there was like sco a score that was being kept internally in his head mm. uh, over time. And I, I would also kind of be aware that there was a score being kept. And so I would tie, I would, um, get more anxious upset about it and yeah. anxious because mm -hmm. I kind of knew I knew that there was a clock and there was a clock mm -hmm. and then it would be like a big blow up. I think also, though, it was like stress from like YouTube and like doing yeah. certain things and like um, but yeah, that was I think that was the biggest hmm. that was the one. Well, yeah. I, it, and an example, uh, another of the two of you being functional, it, it's a. Uh, you know, an event that happened, yeah. but you advocated for yourself and you um, did what you could and succeeded yeah. in, uh, you know, uh, complying with the request yeah. uh, out, of, <laughs> out, of, out of love. Yeah. Um, I want to, I want to ask something cause uh, we touched on it during the, the podcast. So I want to make sure we get to, what is the future for iDubs, because mm. I, I, I want to know from you, Anissa, because um, I don't know. I, I I don't have any huge vested interest, of course, but I, I would like to see you succeed after this Y in the road. And the way that you talk, it sounds like you're uh, floundering or searching. And, you know, we talked about <laughs> this the triangle of YouTube success that we kind of developed randomly. I, I, I can't remember all the points, but I think one of the points was strategy, which I think is the word that you use for um, being very um, good with marketing and with content being interesting and viewable or clickable, um, that the game that you play online to try to uh, be successful. Okay, that, that's the strategy. There's a certain enjoyment of like, okay, how can I make this work? It's like, you know, trying to sell a product or something. I think specifically with influencers, it's, I think it's more about like, what do I do to appear the most likable to the largest amount of people? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you're rewarded, uh, you know, with accolades and money. The, the other um, focus or point on the triangle is, I think we were saying something like passion, mm -hmm. uh, having... Um, uh, you know, gumption to actually do it, yeah. right? And you were thinking you're really good at strategy and in the past you had passion. Um, I can't remember. But anyway, the thing that I was introducing was purpose and meaning mm -hmm. that uh, I wasn't hearing you talk about um, that uh, without purpose and meaning, without a reason why you're on this planet or at least why you're on YouTube, then you're searching for things that you might be able to do that might work, but it lacks any kind of internal motivation, any sort of reason that, that wakes you up in the morning, you know? Uh, and I, just a little bit more before I hear from you is when I f first started out for eight years, I wasn't making it, I was losing money ma making content. Uh, why was I obsessed with it? <laughs> why did I, you know, I'd, I'd tell people at parties, you know, that I had this side gig and they're like, well, why do you do this? Um, particularly older people, young mm. people never asked me that question, but older people would. And I, 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 you know, I had various different answers, but, you know, one of the answers is because um, it's meaningful to me. You know, it, uh, even if I affect in a positive way, one person on the planet, um, I, I, that's what gets me up in the morning. There's various other reasons, but um, in the past, you had the purpose. You were trying, apparently, to protect people from being treated unfairly. Um, and what is the, you know, what is your purpose? And, and have you thought about that more? Uh, I have a little bit. I think I'm, 
reaching that uh, with my therapist a little bit. Uh, we've like touched on it briefly, um, but it, I, I don't know. Like, um, I still think it's kind of the same, yeah. but it's it's more. I think right now trying to figure out where the strategy comes in with that, like, and what is that purpose? purpose. I think it's the same thing, which is uh, wanting. What was it? To uh, stop people from being treated unfairly. Yeah. 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 Protect people. Yeah. I, I am. Yeah. Very concerned with like what I think is fair or right or wrong. Yeah. And I want to express that in a lot of ways. And to be honest, like, you know, an another thing that I have more recently gained uh, awareness of is all of the projects and videos that I've done that in my mind weren't like super impactful that did have like a, a, a meaningful impact on people who are watching mm -hmm. uh like even like just like random uh, unboxing videos that i did you know there's a lot of people who said that was my favorite series i love that and I, when i think about that i'm like oh, that's so crazy because that was like not the thing i was passionate about at all i was just doing it as like filler and what it, did they like about it i think they like uh just about how carefree i was uh because in those videos i wasn't trying to like form an argument i was just opening packages and saying whatever why do they enjoy that um <laughs> you're doing it <laughs> oh fuck well, i'm uh, looking for your purpose yeah they enjoyed it because i think i was being a little bit more uh um how did it affect how did it affect them do you think um i think it made them happy and felt less alone less alone less alone and yeah just like there was someone in the room there with them. And yeah, I think that's what it is. Hmm. Um, and I've kind of heard that over the years for like, like every YouTuber basically, which is some amount of like, you know, whether you make ASMR or whether you're like William Osman and you just do engineering goofy stuff. Yeah. Uh, like some people watch that cause they're so hyper-focused on the technical side of things, but a lot of people watch it just because it's like, I like this guy's personality. He's, He's made a 20 minute video. There's something I can watch while I'm eating my food. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I do relate to that now. I do that for a lot of people. It's just, you know, it doesn't need to be that deep uh, as, you know, what I, I maybe thought that I needed to make in the past mm -hmm. um, to maybe like have an impact. Maybe that's what I want to do. I'm not quite sure. So when you did the video about um, Lazy Bones guy, what, yeah, what's Cart Narcs. Cart Narcs. Um, were you trying to protect the individuals who are being triggered in the videos? Yes. Why do you want to protect them? Uh, I think because I, I think especially now, I know what it feels like to be targeted um, for just being your like, I don't know, authentic self and also not being prepared. I think that's a big part of it is not being prepared for what is going to be put online. Oh. The Cardinal guy is very prepared. He has the GoPro. He, he also knows edits the gonna... whole thing. Mm -hmm. So if he, you just imagine he probably screws up some yeah. and looks bad and he watches the footage. Uh, that's, I'm not going to include that. Yeah. I don't even need to upload the video period if I feel like it makes me look bad. So I think that uh, it feels unfair to me. Uh -huh. So I think that was one of the reasons why I was motivated to make that video. Yeah. Sounds like a, almost like a police officer regarding, oh. regarding videos. What, what would be another word? <laughs> for that? I uh, do think that you like, police. you like giving a voice to people that you feel like their voice isn't loud enough. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, yeah. I feel like I could have done a lot better. I, I think that's another reason why the apology I felt was very necessary is because out of like thinking back to those videos, and I didn't really include this in my apology, is I think if I'm if I really wanted to do that, there was uh, there was a there were a lot more people in much more vulnerable positions that I could have advocated for rather than. Uh, I don't know, like someone like Tana is an example is so silly because it's like she kind of jer just directed her anger at me online. Mm -hmm. And then I just blew it up into a drama thing, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, putting aside your previous content regarding the the negative side that you have identified and described and apologized for, um, what could you look back on that you, you're proud of still, given your mindset, like elements or... Mm. 
Uh, well, I think there was a lot. There's a lot of stuff that I went into kind of knowing that it wasn't going to, I guess, ruffle feathers. That way I don't even need to step into the area of like, are people going to agree or disagree with it? What do you mean? Like, uh, like I guess controversial figures are spe- is speaking about other people uh, and instead focusing on something that interests me. Uh-huh. Uh, so I made some videos like that, just random stuff. Yeah. Totally. Um, is there elements of the main stuff that you were known for? Mm-hmm. You know, the, oh, the anti PC right. culture stuff. Is there something in there that you're like, well, yeah, I'm not going to say it was all wrong. Right. <laughs> yes, for sure. I would say, um, specifically the one I had mentioned to you at the start of the uh, podcast, the one about Keemstar. I was like, I think there were bits and pieces of that that I wouldn't include now. But I think the I think someone did need to say something. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I felt passionate. I, I still feel pretty passionate about it. And, you know, I, I think some people take it a little too far. And that's, you know, the – I think that's what I did. Um, but, uh, yeah, it dis- – people have discussions on the internet all the time about – whatever, whatever is the, you know, popular thing that people feel like is worth discussing for a while for us, it was only fans, whether it's right or wrong or whatever, or if I'm comfortable with it or not. Mm-hmm. So I, I, yeah, I don't, um, I think it's also totally okay for you to like have things that you really liked about the content cop series. Cause I think, mm-hmm. I think that, um, there's a fear that I think he has that if he acknowledges things that were positive about it or that he believes in still that it will ruin the overall apology Mm. um, rather than being able to pick out like this was like a good thing that I believed in and still believe in at my core, Mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. Like the Keemstar video Mm. and there's a few others, there are a lot of things in there that you yeah. believe in mm-hmm. and that you think are important conversations to have that I'm sure you're still proud that you had that, you mm-hmm. started that conversation. Yeah, totally. And I think that's fine for you to like mm-hmm. yeah. acknowledge. Yeah, I think you're you're right. Yeah. I do hesitate to want to say that it's the whole reason I, you know, made the apology in the first place instead of making like a, a content cop type video on myself because that was another like idea. Mm -hmm. Um, where it was like, oh, I can just entertain again and, you know, like, uh, do the same thing I did to other people to myself. I thought about that. I thought about inviting you over if you wanted to, and of course, you know, whatever, (laughs) but if, (laughs) if you don't want to, I thought it would be kind of interesting. I'd be curious to, um, watch because I haven't seen. Oh. Like they're, they're, oh. they're all private or unlisted. I, I have, I've seen clips in other takedowns. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, so I, I don't know. But I think it might be at the very least interesting. And um, my because when was the last time you watched some of those videos? I mean, I don't really rewatch any of the videos. Yeah. So. I mean, it could be tr- literally traumatic for you. But uh, uh, but it. You know, there's a lot of things to sift through specifically because yeah. for my curiosity, it'd be interesting to see you say, OK, what I just said there, that's I shouldn't be saying that because mm. the, the kinds of ways that you talk about it is detail, you know, 100 times more detailed than the typical public apology. So, you know, kudos for that. But maybe it'd be interesting for people to right. see like exactly you know, that thing right there mm. is, is not okay. Here's where I was coming from, but mm-hmm. no, um, that bit, I, you know, yeah, I can, I can get, a, I can get still on board with that bit yeah, or whatever. That might be good, especially like for a lot of the fans who do have, uh, you know, they're nostalgic about it and they feel like I, you know, abandoned them or attacked them for, yeah. Having liked it. Yeah. I think there's a lot of confused people that think that you blanket are like, all of it is terrible. Mm-hmm. And I don't, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I, and I think, I think there's a lot of people who heard what you said and said, they think that you said that like, you're terrible if you liked this. Yeah. Um, so it I was think- funny. The, 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 uh, theme 
and I can't not see through my lens, but yeah. the theme of avoidance, right? Uh, calling up Anissa and saying, um, shut it down for two weeks. Uh, uh, shutting down your your online shtick and just saying, I'm going to avoid and reject and turn away from the whole ball of wax. Um, but maybe what is in your heart is more of a, a you know, a balance back and forth or um, a sifting through or I don't, you know, you're, you're kind of like calling up yourself and saying, I need a break. And then you never called yourself back. I agree. That's a really good way to put that. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. My mom said that about me. Really? Yeah. yeah. And she said something, yeah, about like, I don't know. She, she's she got her own examples, but I think one of the like weird random pivots is I was like playing World of Warcraft religiously in high school. And like, that's all I did for a year. And then I just stopped. And then I just did something entirely different. You have always been that way. You did that again with yeah. World of Warcraft. You, that's, yeah. Uh, his mom is very emotionally intelligent. Um, she really helped me at the beginning of me trying to, you know, work through what I was going through. Mm. And um, the two observations she made about Ian, three actually. One, she said uh, he it was he was swimming and there was a big diving board and he didn't want to go off of it like he you know would refuse every time they go and then one day he just she said he just took his flip flops up and off and just climbed up and just jumped right off like didn't even say anything and that was it um and that's true for him you that's the way he is it's like you can't get him to do something until he de- he'll just one day decide like I'm going to do this um the other thing she said is that you're a big sponge empathetically mm. you you'll um she said she was really stressed for work one day and when she was leaving, she locked herself out and she looked over at Ian and he was holding all of the mm. stress. He was, he was young. And she said, I could tell like he feels a lot for other people, mm. which I also agree with. And the other thing she said was that you, you will, you'll just shut that mm-hmm. door. She actually said to me when I first met Ian, the first month I went over to her house and she said, um, Anissa, at some point he's probably going to tell you to go home. He doesn't mean it, and he will call you. That's what she said to me, mm. which is crazy mm-hmm. um, and uh, true, <laughs> which is yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. But, yeah, your mom very uh, – it's, so it's interesting she said that to you as yeah. well. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and I think it would be really good. I, that's a very exciting thing, I think, to be able to – I think fans would really like that yeah, a yeah. lot. I mean, I've, I've been wanting to do something like that because I do have a lot of thoughts – on, uh, you know, past content, I know there's something to it. Uh, that's actually even a variety of content that people have made, even if they haven't done anything, like made like really controversial videos. Mm, it's just been like, videos. you're looking, I think MKBHD did one where he's just watching a video when he was basically like 11, reviewing like an iPhone or something. Mm. And it's like, that's pretty funny. It's interesting to look back on yourself in that way. Um yeah, I, I don't suffer from that because when I started, I was um, a 38 or something. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's not as embarrassing for me. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. That's <laughs> a cool position. God being. help me if I was your age. And yeah. That sort of oh. atrocious. Even your age now, I can't imagine yeah. if I had an iPhone and access to YouTube, what kind of ridiculousness I'd be making. I oh. look back at my first stream and I sound so different. Higher pitched, like it's just weird to even, you know, when you're 21, 20, yeah. you look at that and you're like, what the? Yeah. And I, I had a lot of, I was very misogynistic and weird, mm. you know, so like that's all on the internet. Mm. But, you know, we're, we're all on our journey. Totally. Yeah. 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 Um, is there a, like a specific thing that you find your, or that you've maybe even been surprised by that you are like disconnected from when it comes to like, maybe not your audience, but like the internet in general, like anything that surprised you like, oh, I'm, we're not on the same page at all. Yeah. I mean, it happens all the time uh, when I watch reality TV, um, like I sent a survey out to people and said, you know, ask their opinions about things. And I think I got a lot more of a representative sample of people's opinions because, you know, in the comment section, people are very nice to me. They know how thin my skin is. And so 
there can be a lot of um, a sort of a curating of what I am exposed to. <laughs> Plus, when Alina tells me don't look at something, then I, you know I don't get to see it necessarily. Mm-hmm. Although I do tell them to tell me the gist. You know, if I just hear a summary, they don't they don't agree with you on this point. Okay, yeah, it, that doesn't get under anyway. But yeah, it happens a lot. Um, but I think what you might be asking is like some kind of larger thing. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, it happens all the time. The, there's so many things that at least I think are important that most people don't. Um, but yeah, there's all sorts of things like, you know, the word narcissist has just been mm. completely corrupted. And uh, gaslighting. Gaslighting. Uh you know, even just using the term sociopath is is a little weird. Yeah. Um, so there's those kinds of things. You know, of course, borderline is misrepresented online, but it, it always has been. A lot of clinicians misrepresent borderline as well. I'll mm-hmm. be in consult meetings that might look similar to this, except without the microphones. And I'll just be like, shut up, Kirk. Don't get into it with that person because everyone else kind of agrees <laughs> that yeah. borderline is this or borderline is that. It's also interesting because... Borderline, it seems like a lot of the symptoms line up with just women with autism as well. A lot of the symptoms when you read Could them. Be. So like I, I've I've heard a lot of people like talk about borderline specifically, and it's it's hard for me to understand because most therapists that I've talked to at least, they say like, yeah, people can have tendencies and we can like work on those individual tendencies, mm-hmm. but to get like a borderline diagnosis is like a weird thing to do. Yeah, well, and there's a lot of stigma. Yeah. Um, in my world, for someone to qualify for the diagnosis doesn't mean all the things that even other clinicians will think that it means. Mm. Um, I specialize in borderline and I have tremendous compassion mm. for them. And yeah, there can be issues, transference, whatnot, but I am you know, very close to these people and yeah. work with them for years. That's why I wanted you to do Ethan Klein's I wanted you to talk to Ethan and Trisha when they were doing their podcast together so bad. Um, and they ended up getting Dr. Uh, uh, yeah. What's his name? Yeah. Um, we all Adam have and his... Adam Carolla and Dr. Drew. Drew. Yeah, yeah, that's what. Yeah. I, I wanted so badly. I did to react to, to those videos. Really? I haven't yeah. seen them. Yeah. Um, um, Cause but... like, I thought the way that you've talked about BPD specifically and that you work with, cause there's a lot of, I've heard therapists say like, I don't work with, BPD yeah. or um so I I really wanted to hear you interact with Trisha because I just thought it would be a an interesting thing yeah but I think Trisha might have reached out to me actually really yeah I I, I don't remember um or talked about me publicly I can't mm. remember but um but yeah I I have those impulses a lot um this is kind of a dream talking to the two of you oh really that's <laughs> cool <laughs> because when I see these kinds of things, I'm, I have all my ideas, you know, yeah. and I uh, want to ask the questions. I, I don't know. I'm just a naturally inquisitive I'm person. I'm curious what you thought when you saw Ian do this. Like, what was your, like, idea of what happened there? Like, if your initial, like, instinct. Um, I didn't know. All I knew of Ian was that he was one of William Osmond's friends. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you were in a, a number of, you were a frequent flyer on his channel. Yeah. yeah. The egg drop stuff and then driving that little car across yeah. LA. Oh, yeah. Taking the car apart too. Yeah. yeah. And the two of you had great chemistry, I thought. Yeah. Um, and that's all I knew of you. So when I saw the, oh, and I knew you from the boxing thing. And then I mm-hmm. saw the, um, the apology video, uh, um, I was actually, it's interesting, I was listening back to our interview <laughs> that we had, and about halfway through, I was like, oh, your whole thing was anti-PC culture. I, I didn't even know that. Mm. <laughs> I thought you were just kind of a, I don't know, like just a shock jock is what we used to call him, where mm. you would just kind of be, you know, like um, Howard Stern or something. Yeah. Yeah. But you had a very specific uh, thing. And so when you were apologizing, I'm trying to remember what I was thinking. Um um, yeah, I, yeah, I didn't know. Well, didn't that know. was one of the things, uh, if I recall your uh, rating correctly. Yeah. It was basically like, yeah, as like someone who doesn't know what he he's really talking about, like what he's apologizing for specifically, like 
you know, I don't really know because I didn't like, you know, show clips or give like examples necessarily. So I was, mm. I was docking you for not being specific. Is that what you're saying? Full I think context. so. Yeah. 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 Full context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, and that's just my style. Um, yeah. Totally. Uh, but, you know, in spite of that, your apology, like Ethan Klein's apology actually, mm. uh, had a lot of seeming genuineness and detail. Yeah. You know, and auth authenticity, which, I I I must have said positive things about because it's so rare that mm -hmm. I see that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is very. What were you thinking when he was working on that video and posting it? Scared. Of what? Um, I I fa I I think I hold a lot of self hatred for coming into his life, mm. and um. You know, uh, th we've had a lot of conversations and he's changed a lot of opinions just from talking to me and and, you know, meeting people and doing things that he normally wouldn't have done, mm -hmm. you know, had I not been in his life. You're worried that you ruined him. Yeah. I and and it is like a it's a common theme. You know, people were saying it before that video even came out and and um, and they definitely were after. Yeah. And I, I asked him I've asked him this a couple of times, like if he could go back to being the way that he was and thinking the things that he was and have all the money again and all the, you know, success and whatever, or be where he is now, like which one would, would he choose? And he always tells me like, I, I, you know, now that I know what I know and I'm feeling what I'm feeling, I can't like the idea of going back is not an option, but it's still like having it put out and be solidified. I, I know it, I, it's very selfish, but it was this fear that, everyone would, it would be like, oh, confirmed mm -hmm. that she, like, she, this is her fault. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there was, like, uh, there was obviously, like, a sense of, like, I, whenever Ian says he wants to do something and he does it, there is always a sense of, like, pride in that he really does, like, when he decides something, like, that's it. And he does it and he falls through and he never cuts corners. Jumped like, off the diving board. Yeah. Just like walked he, up there. And <laughs> even the boxing that's jumping off the diving board. Like he went, he had no physical anything. And then he picked a guy that is like, he was like a D1 athlete and had been, you know, doing pad work for like 10 years and was bigger than him and was, you know, uh, familiar with competitive stuff and and he uh, was like i'm gonna a, fight him and intimate with anatomy so he knew how to <laughs> break you <laughs> and it, and and even in that moment it's the same i i love watching ian do things it is uh, it's m where i'm happy is watching him say he's gonna do something and do it but just like in the boxing where i'm proud and i'm happy and i think that that is you know where he should be i'm sitting there terrified like i want to vomit yeah because i I'm seeing him put himself completely out there. You're worried that he's going to be attacked. And hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, yeah. I, I hope people have told you that, it, uh, the two of you really, that it's okay that you helped him change. Yeah. Um, and it's something you should be proud of as a couple because it was a good change. Yeah, yeah, and that's <laughs> so, like what I so, uh, uh, if if the internet's accusing you of being the puppet master, then we should be applauding you. You know, yeah. it, I, mean, I was going to say some kind of Hitler analogy. If <laughs> if, if only Eva Braun had such, yeah. but uh, that's stupid. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's comparing you in the past. But um, so. I uh, I hope that people say this to you, and I hope that it's in your heart, and I hope that that's that's the narrative. And you know, fuck the haters. Yeah, I'm working on it. I think that's what my main like. It's crazy, right? You you go through something traumatic like losing your dog very suddenly, and you're in therapy, and you're like talking about completely other thing, like different things within like two sessions. And that's like the main the main thing for me right now is like. What do I want to do on the internet? Do I even want to be on the internet? And coming to terms with what my influence has been on him and being okay and proud of mm -hmm. us growing together. Yeah, and, and the way that I see it, the narrative that I, we came to was it wasn't that you pressured him or, I don't know, influenced him in that way. It was the independent of online stuff. You were really struggling with your relationship and a part of that was you 
being aware of your emotions and aware of her emotions. And you, you know, got to a lot of whys in the road and went down enough of them to start to build that connection and, and stop avoiding uh, yeah. doing your best to do that uh, for your benefit and her benefit, your relationship's benefit. And through that very healthy uh, um, change, you were open now to emotions you were probably feeling throughout. Mm-hmm. You know, the example that you gave in, in another interview was a trans person comes up to you at the event and says, I know you don't like trans people, but could I get a selfie? And if you hadn't had that uh, couple uh, uh, growth with your emotions, you might have not felt much. Right. You wouldn't have known you felt. That's the key. And in that moment, you you felt something. <laughs> what is this frustration? And then you you're open that you're right. you're now thinking. Well, wait. Um, and then you know that builds. So you weren't. You know what changed you in my mind is. Once you became more human, more of you, more, um, you know, uh, discarding of the defense that you had to develop to robotize yourself as a child, you could enact your true self, which was not, you know, maybe the first number of videos was your true self, but at a certain point, um, it wasn't your true self, apparently, because it built up to a point where you're just like, it just doesn't feel right. Mm-hmm. It's not congruent with me. Yeah. Not this is what she wants me to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, but th- it's it's not really congruent with who I am. Totally. And I, I try to, yeah. I, I think when you get those worries or fears that you are responsible, I'm like, I, I try to say like, to be honest, like anyone who's like holding me accountable for being like even an okay or decent partner. Mm-hmm. I would have gone through, I think, a lot of these changes that the internet doesn't like specifically. Yeah, it would have happened. Yeah. You know, I think all of the extra stuff, I think, you know, there's a lot that you provided. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, there's really no, you know, I think the only way, you know, the internet wouldn't get upset is if I probably stayed, you know, very steadfast, very single and very, like, you know, ignoring things. Yeah. Yeah. And I do, I, I mean, I don't know. I was in relationships before him and I, I do have to say though, that like the choices you made constantly were very, um, hard. I think like it was hard for you to, to do, um, because people before you that I was with, they, they didn't want to make those choices. Mm. Oh, right. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. What, what um, kind of choices? Like t- having, feelings like talking about feelings e- yeah. even mm-hmm. um i had a lot of partners that like if they were having a, a bad day they just they didn't want to talk and then i was getting a phone call a week later of like i don't want to date anymore basically mm-hmm. um so some of that some of like you know ch- cheating mm-hmm. you know people when they're feeling pressure I've, I've had partners cheat on me i've you know you just never you never did any of that uh, are you thankful that she influenced you in this way? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, the example that she was kind of giving, well, I I think, I don't know. I am a bit of a sponge and like a lot of the things that she uh, describes like admiring in other people, I'm like, I kind of want to strive to be like those people. Um, Like uh, even when we're like, just, I don't know. It's made me a little bit, trying to think like uh like uh just being i think more thoughtful and like not a lot of these like super toxic masculine traits and like you know alpha male being aggressive being loud you know all this stuff like she's been very vocal since the beginning that she doesn't like that and it's like it's yeah. painful in a lot of ways to like even experience someone doing that even if you're not connected it's like oh man and i've kind of like i i guess i never really had a strong opinion one way or the other about that i think i was probably just towing the line of society in a lot of ways where it's just like yeah i have some general like ideas of maybe how i should act as a man and that probably is a little bit more on the aggressive a little bit more on the ignore your emotions kind of 
side of things. Uh, so yeah, over the years, uh, just being very open to, I think what Nisa admired kind of put me on that path a little bit more where I'm like, yeah. And, and even just thinking about it myself, I'm like, yeah, like having like outbursts or being aggressive, uh, I don't know, like random road rage examples or people on reality TV. I'm just like, I don't like how, uh, like the lack of control, it seems like these people have. And once I saw that myself, I'm like, oh, shoot, I don't have control right now in this moment of how I feel or any of this stuff or what I'm thinking. Yeah, you talked about that um, screaming match you had in, mm -hmm. in Canada and you could hear yourself reverberating, yeah. reverberating <laughs> yeah. half of the buildings. You thought like, what is happening? I was like, I've witnessed other people do this. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm in it right now. I am that guy. Yeah. Hmm. Which yeah. like, yeah, I think it's... Um, uh, it's commendable that it, 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 that's a why in the road. Yeah. Um, there's apparently a lot of people, they don't make the choice of health or of um, being happy. <laughs> you know, they continue to go down that negative road. They justify it to themselves. And then when they see someone that they think is in their in-group making a different choice, they make hour-long videos about <laughs> how stupid his wife is um, because you're challenging a defense of theirs that uh, uh, doesn't have any merit and they they feel it. They don't know it, but they feel it. And you doing what you are doing, it, it just is pulling the rug out from underneath them. And But they have to make a choice and they have to invest. They ask, you know, they need a, they need an Anfisa in their life. Yeah. <laughs> they need an Anissa in their life. <laughs> That's the, la the, I think the last question we should probably end. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I have a question okay. that I, because we talked about this at um, breakfast this morning. Um, Ian has like now gone through this and, and, it, you know, is at the 5% or, or, you know, whatever percent. And we were wondering if you had any advice on how to bring people that are in our lives still and people that he, mm. you know, knows personally from the 0% over the, the hump to the 5%, what are things that he could do in these, you know, friendships, relationships, interactions to like help other people get? Other avoided men? Yeah. Um, well, you're leading by example and case by case. But you could also, when you're having a conversation, just uh, focus or occasionally ask how they feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not a frequent question that anyone asks, particularly if people present like they don't have feelings. Mm. But, you know, they're talking about something that's that could be something that they feel hurt or afraid of. And you just say, wow, that sounds, that sounds you know, they're just like, oh, this thing happened. Da, 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 and it's a, wow, you to, uh, how'd that feel? Or, wow, if I were in your shoes, I, that would kind of terrify me. Mm -hmm. You know, just... That's what I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how I manipulate my friends. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. I'll try that. Cool. I think that's... Uh... Yeah. I need to get better at uh, questions in the moment. I think it's very uh, difficult to... Uh, there's so many... With all my guy friends, there's so much like focus on like other things. Like you, you hear about this, you hear about that. Let's look at this. What about this game? Also, the other thing you can do is assume that they want to talk about the things they're avoiding because mm -hmm. it's not a matter of pushing someone off the high dive. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, leaving it out there to explore. And people want to, to take that leap. They have a natural tendency to do that. They gave up that when they were young mm -hmm. or when they were a teen or something. It's, it's not something you have to drag them. Right. You, you just have to create the ground that they will they'll just go, huh, they'll, they'll rush into it you know cool. what I mean? yeah that's yeah. cool i, I mean i like felt that. that in therapy so relatable yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, i'm so excited that uh he's doing therapy i think it's 
like we're both doing therapy at the same time. I just think it's so cool. When you get out of sessions, do you go like, oh my God, I just had yes. this thing. Yeah. Does he, we, does he do that? We, uh, yeah, we go, at, he goes, well, how, what did you talk about today? <laughs> um, but we go at the same time and we see different therapists. Um, oh, same time. So we just go into the room at the same time and then we go off to our different. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Sometimes I'm coming out, I'm crying. Sometimes she's coming out, she's crying. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah it's, no, it's. It's good. It's exciting. And it's it's good because we have like we can bounce it off. We really love now to talk about our feelings or what's going on or how things are. He tries to pull me into a more optimistic direction. If I'm feeling kind of gloomy, we'll like, you know, explore that. And it's been I don't know. It's so weird. Like the the Internet is it, it's the worst it's ever been or it's been really difficult. But we we are happy, like the happiest we've ever been, and it's a very weird space to be in. Mm. Because if you if we look online, we can have a really bad day, but at least we're having a bad day together, and it feels like manageable no matter what. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think what scares me about that is like, what happens if one of us freaking croaks or something? Oh yeah, that's that the, that's suck. that pessimism. You see. <laughs> There it is. That's yes. Yeah. And that's a that's my that's a me problem. Uh thank you for being here, Kirk. Yeah. Sure. Just no, just fun. make sure he just drives safe all the time. Yes. We we limit driving specifically because I'm so terrified of getting in an accident. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh do you have anything that you want to promote other than psychology in Seattle? I would like to promote IDub's new career. Nice. As content police officer where he lives within his purpose and his passion and, um, and strategy. Oh, yeah. I do like that. Some people are going to like that. Yeah, some people are going to get really excited about that. Cool. Thank you. Oh, Us. wait, wait. Also, they did a podcast together on Kirk's. Yes. Podcast. Yeah. It was Spotify and YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you want How long's the video? Uh, I don't know. Hour or something? Yeah. yeah. It's long. So it's, long. it's over there. Yeah. yeah. We'll put a link in the description. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, now we can say it. All right. Hasta la vista. Hasta la vista. <laughs> Baby. <laughs> Hell yeah. Nice. All right.